Um, we're awesome. very pleased today to have David Bly with us from Princeton University. Uh, I think a lot of people here already know Dave and his work, especially on latent rich lay allocation. Um, and he did his PhD at Berkeley, and there's several folks here who probably I should ask for, for war stories from that whole time. But since then, he also did a postdoc with John Lafferty at CMU, and there's some joint work with him. Um, and he's now, for the past four semesters now, or starting your yeah. fourth semester, um, a professor at Princeton University. So we're very happy to have Dave here. We'll be talking about modeling science. Okay. Thanks, Miran. Should I stand up here? Is that, did we come to a consensus? or Okay, great. Um, my name is Dave. I'm going to talk about modeling science. This is joint work with John Lafferty, and it's um, it's a little long. So you know, I, I'd prefer to have to cut it short and everybody be kind of understanding things. So that's okay. So feel free to interrupt if you don't understand something, even though it's long. Okay. So what this uh, project's about? Our, our data are Science Magazine from 1880 to 2002, courtesy of. JSTOR. So JSTOR does a process that I think you know well here, where they take um, original volumes of journal articles, they scan them, they run OCR software on them, and then they index the resulting noisy ASCII text so that scholars and scientists can search through hundreds of years of scholarly literature. So in the journal Science, here are some examples of articles from the journal Science. This one's about poisoning by ice cream. Um, this process results in 130,000 documents, a uh, corpus that has 76 million words. Anywhere else, this is a big number. Here, it's like a toy data set. So the idea is that we want to take this collection and discover the hidden thematic structure that lives inside it with, I'm sorry, it's awkward, um, uh, with what are called topic models. These are hierarchical probabilistic models of text that use multinomial distributions over words um, to, to capture these hidden themes. And then we want to figure out ways to use this structure for, to do things like browsing, search, similarity assessment between these articles. The basic idea is that you know, JSTOR takes these, these volumes, they scan them, and they just have a big bag of documents. There's no structure. There's no metadata. There's no keywords. Nobody has typed in, oh, this is this place in the hierarchy. And people want to take articles from the 1800s and the 1950s and understand where they sit in the broader setting. And so that's what we're, we're trying to do here. OK, so what topic models can do are things like automatically discover topics from a collection of documents, um, automatically label previously unlabeled images, model what I'll talk about today, the evolution of topics over time, um, model the way these topics, these groups of words that go together, uh, the way these topics go together, how they, how they map, um, and, and so on. And so what I want to talk about today is, uh, first I'm going to introduce latent Dirichlet allocation, which is uh, kind of a, a, the simplest topic model, um, and then extend it to dynamic topic models that we'll go in some detail, uh, and then finally discuss correlated topic models just very briefly, just to kind of show you a picture. But so we'll focus on dynamic topic models and quickly review latent Dirichlet allocation. But if no one understands, then we, I'm happy to even stop here. I could even stop now. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so. The idea here is that we're going to take our documents and we're going to, we're going to model them probabilistically. In probabilistic modeling, what we do is we treat our data as observations that arise from some generative process that includes things that we can't observe. So in the case of modeling document collections, the things we can't observe are the underlying thematic structure of the collection. So that's posing the model. And then the second thing you want to do, of course, is to take your the things you do observe, the documents, and infer what that hidden structure is. And we do that with posterior inference. And so in the case here, it's asking what are the topics that describe this collection of documents that I want to analyze. Um, finally, of course, we want to then situate new data into the estimated model. For example, how does this query or new document fit into the estimated topic structure? And then use that to do things like information retrieval or classification, or just something vague like browsing and organizing. OK, so the intuition behind latent Dirichlet allocation, we'll call it LDA, and I'm sorry for linear discriminant analysis um, people, but the intuition behind LDA is this. It's that documents exhibit multiple topics. So here's an example document from our collection. This is called Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities. And this is an article about asking how many genes does an organism need to survive in 
evolutionary terms. And what I've done here by hand is just highlighted different words. So I've highlighted words like organism, survive, life, words about evolutionary biology in pink. I've highlighted words like genes, genomes, sequenced, words about genetics in yellow. And I've highlighted words like predictions, computer analysis, computation, words about data analysis and statistics in, uh, I guess, blue, but it looks like gray. So I've highlighted these words, and you can imagine that this article, the words in this article, combine words about evolutionary biology, genetics, and statistical analysis. So the idea is to then cast this intuition into a generative probabilistic process. And that <coughs> process is as follows. We, let's pretend that living somewhere are 100 distributions over words. And some of them have words like genetics with high probability. Some have words like evolutionary biology with high probability. Some have words about data analysis with high probability. And some have words about other stuff with high probability that happen not to be in this document. So holding those fixed, we generate each document by first choosing a, a little distribution over those distributions over words, which we call topics. So if there are 100 topics, then here the x-axis are 100 elements. And here I've decided that the blue topic has this probability, the yellow topic has this probability, the pink topic has this probability. OK, that's the first step of this imaginary process. And then what we do is for each word in the collection, we choose one of those topic indexes, indices. Um, so here I chose the blue one. Then we look up what distribution over words the blue coin refers to, and then we choose a word from that distribution. So here I chose the word analysis. Similarly, I, ch I choose the yellow topic here, and I looked up what distribution over words it came from, and I choose the word genome, or the pink topic, and I choose the word organism. And the idea is we repeat this process for every word in our document, beginning with randomly selecting a distribution over these distributions, and then for each word choosing one of those distributions over words and drawing the word from that distribution. OK, is that clear? Um, right. And we repeat this process for every document. So another document that's not about this stuff first chooses a different distribution over the topics and then draws its words from those topics. And the idea is that this happens for each document. OK, but of course, in reality, we only observe the documents. We don't get to see all this hidden structure. So the goal is to infer this underlying topic structure, to take a collection of articles figure out what topics each word came from, what distribution over topics those articles came from, and figure out what are the distributions over words that those topics correspond to automatically. OK, so, um, and, and so to describe our probability model, I'm going to use graphical models. I know probably many of you are familiar with them, but just to quickly remind you, a graphical model is a graph where nodes uh, are random variables. Edges denote possible dependence between random variables. And observed variables are shaded. So here I've observed x1 through xn, and y is hidden. OK? And in, I'm going to use this plate notation a lot, where um, replicated structure can be shorthanded by drawing a box around a variable and giving it a little index and writing down how many replications of that random variable we had. So this graphical model structure is shorthand by this. OK. In a graphical model, the structure of the graph defines a pattern of conditional dependence between the ensemble of random variables that the nodes represent. So for example, in this graph, it corresponds to this joint distribution, a joint distribution on y and x1 through xn, which can be factorized as the probability of y times conditionally independent, the probability of each of the x random variables. OK, so this graph defines this factorization. It's not necessarily true for every joint distribution here, but it's got to factorize like this for this graph. OK, so that generative process that I described for you looks like this as a graphical model. Um, so let me just, I'll, I'll go through it the way I talked about it before, but pointing at these, at these nodes instead. So to begin with, we choose our k topics, our k distributions over words. So each of these beta k's is a distribution over all the words in the vocabulary. So let's say k is 100. I'm going to start doing this. Let's say k is 100. Some of these betas are going to have genes words with high probability. Some are going to have data words with high probability, and so on. But, so we begin our process by choosing all those from a distribution over them, which is a Dirichlet. Then for each document, that's this D plate here. We first choose our distribution over those topics. 
So if there's 100 topics, then theta is that little cartoon histogram that I had on the right side of the document. Theta is the yellow topic with some probability, the blue topic with some probability, the pink topic with some probability. And that gets cho chosen randomly from a distribution over distributions, which is the Dirichlet. That's why we have Dirichlet. OK, so that's how we start. Then for each word, that's this n plate within the d plate, because we have d documents, and each document, say, has n words. I know in reality documents have different numbers of words, but just let's assume that they don't right now. Um, for each word, we first choose a topic indicator, z, from our distribution over topic. So this is like choosing the yellow coin. OK, that's just an indicator of which topic I'm going to choose the word from. So say that's topic number 35. Then to choose the word, I look up the 35th topic, the 35th distribution over words, and I draw the word from that topic. OK, so say here, I, again, I have this combination of topics of uh, genetics, evolutionary biology, and data. Sometimes I'm going to choose the genetics topic and draw genetics words. Sometimes I'm going to choose the evolutionary biology topic and draw evolutionary biology words, and so on. And so you can see that this describes how one might have generated that document. And for each document in the collection, I choose a different distribution over these topics and generate different combinations. So others might be partly about evolutionary biology, but they're about evolutionary biology in combination with other things. OK, any questions about this generative process? Yeah. It all looks very natural, except for the Dirichlet part. I mean, uh, I don't believe topics are chosen that way. Right. Um, I mean, I don't believe that documents are written this way either. <laughs> um, but that's a good point. So in, in any model, and that's going to be one of the themes of this talk, in any model, we're making major, majorly bad assumptions about our data. Um, but the purpose is to be able to get at some of these salient themes. And so the Dirichlet seems OK for doing that, although later we're going to actually relax that assumption. But that's a good point. So all of, these, all of these decisions that we've made in building this model contain assumptions in them that are either we know about or don't. And understanding how those assumptions affect our analysis is part of this activity. Yeah? So can I ask you, why did you choose Dirichlet uh, as opposed to others? Is, is it because the math behind it is easier? Mm -hmm. The math and the computation, that's right. So the Dirichlet has this nice property that, again, we're going to relax it later on at some point. But the Dirichlet has this nice property that um, it's conjugate to the multinomial. So say I knew this topic indicator, then the posterior distribution of theta, the distribution of theta given this topic indicator, would still be a Dirichlet. And that really simplifies the computation later on. That's why we choose the Dirichlet. Those are good questions. Other questions? OK. So. Like I said before, we only observe, you can see in this, we have you know, all these nodes here, but the only thing that's shaded are the nth word in the dth document. What we have is a big collection of documents that are divided up into which words are in which documents. And so our goal is to infer all this other structure around it, essentially reverse that generative process. For each document, we want to look at what the per word topic assignment is. We want to look at the per document topic proportions and very what we're very interested in is looking at what are these distributions over words that generated this. You can think of this as like we're reducing the dimension of, the, of this document collection, which has dimension number of words, into a collection of distributions of, uh, into, into k-dimensional vectors. We'll see that later in a second. OK. So here is this posterior distribution, the probability of theta and z given everything else, even just a part of that posterior. And even computing this is intractable, but there have been several approximation techniques that have been developed uh, in, in recent years. Mean field variational methods is what um, we'll be using today, uh, but also people have developed expectation propagation, collapsed Gibbs sampling, and something I'm excited about, EY Tay and some colleagues did collapsed variational inference, which kind of takes the best of these two worlds. Um, and it's a very efficient uh, inference technique. So, all this is to say, we can't really compute that hidden structure that we want to, but we can approximate it. And that's what we're going to do. OK, so let's look at some examples. So let's just take 10 years of our science collection, um, which is about 17,000 documents, 11 million words, and a vocabulary size of 20,000, where we've removed stop words and rare words to, again, speed up the computation. So 
uh, stop words, of course, are, are words like of and the and but. I don't need to tell you that. Um, and rare words are words that occur fewer than five times in this case. OK, and we fit a 100 topic LDA model using mean field variational inference. Excuse me, how do you take, how do you take terms? How do you know the unique terms? How do you pick them? Ah, so, so what I did was I looked at my articles and I computed the vocabulary. I looked at how, which words occurred in those articles. And I also computed how many times each one occurred. And so if something occurred less than five times, I just removed it from the vocabulary. It's as though that article didn't contain that term. Fixing the topic a requirement before? The number of topics? Yeah. Um, it is right now. It, it is here. Yeah. In a different model, it's not. OK. Hooray. So, I, OK, so that article that I showed you before actually wasn't in the collection that I'm looking at. It's, it's, we're going to think of it as a test article. And uh, what we can do is we can take that article. Uri. So how do you decide which are the stop words? Uh, do you have a list? I have a list. I downloaded it in 2000. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's not a great list. Um, okay, so here's that same article from before. Uh, again, seeking life's bare genetic necessities. And what I can do is I can, so, I, so let me stop. First, I take all the other articles and I fit one of these models. So I get my topics, I get all this structure out of it, and I know what the what the 100 distributions over words that generated those articles are. Now I take this new article and I do posterior inference. So I ask, OK, what is the, say I hold those topics fixed, what is this hidden structure of this article? In other words, what topics generated the words in this article? And you can look at the posterior distribution, the, the, the distribution of the topic proportions given the words um, here. So this is like a, the, the inferred histogram from, from this article, the, the cartoon histogram that I drew. This is the inference of, the, of that histogram uh, if we fit a model with real data, when we fit a model with real data. And what you can see is that out of the 100 topics, only a handful of them seem to have been activated. Yeah, Yoram. So, so you jumped right to the inference, but um, regarding the estimation process itself, so you decided that there are 100 topics. That's right. And is there any sort of topic information type of supervision from? None, none. none. Yeah, I, I should so have stressed that. So it was fully that. unsupervised. Yeah, yeah. So let's just go back to the graphical model. Remember, the only thing that we observe is are the words of each document. This is all the information we have. So everything else is inferred. Those 100 distributions over words are inferred. That's, that's a good point. Um, so there's no, the, we, we don't encode anything like, oh, there's this thing called genetics. There's this thing called evolutionary biology. We don't encode that at all into this model. OK. Um, and so here, what you can see is that just a handful of those topics have been activated. So it says, well, I know the topics, and I, I see all these words, and I think, OK, these words came from this handful of topics. And moreover, we can then look at, so remember, each of those topics is a distribution over words, and we can look at, at we can order the words by their probability under the topic, and we can look at the first few, and what you can see is that they correspond to things that we recognize as genetics evolutionary biology, diseases, and computer analysis. And, and again, remember, these ideas weren't previously encoded into the model. Just by looking at the patterns of word co-occurrences, they, they come out of the analysis. Yeah? This histogram is uh, some kind of mean field histogram, I suppose. Uh, it's the approximate. Because, I mean, in the, in the exact um, model somehow you have, and I don't know exactly how you do it, in the exact model you have some distribution over the uh, over the proportions. That's right. So that's right. So uh, just to be clear, what I did. So what we're interested in is the probability of theta. That's the histogram given the document. Okay. Hold, hold the topics fixed. Right. Okay. I took. I estimated that distribution. I took its mean. Mm -hmm. That mean is a histogram, right. and that's what I illustrated. Okay. okay. Um, right. So that was the quick review of LDA. We can kind of take all these documents. We can analyze them. We can learn these distributions over words that seem to correspond to topics. So th this is a powerful model for, one, visualizing this hidden thematic structure in a large corpus, although I want to be cautious. It's, you don't want to overinterpret these things and say, oh, well, you don't want to make like, decisions about whether or not you should approve a drug based on these kinds of inferences. But 
for visualizing some kind of structure that might be useful to somebody trying to sort through these documents, LDA is useful, um, and for generalizing new data to fit into that structure. Now, the, the kind of where this sits in, in, in previous work, it's a, it's a mixed membership model. Um, in statistics, that, that's what it's called, meaning instead of be, belonging to a single topic, like a finite mixture model would, the documents can belong to multiple topics through this through this topic histogram and, and the idea that the words are grouped, but each one can come from different topics. Um, and this really builds on the work of LSI and PLSI, which were alternative ways to do this. This is kind of more of a fully Bayesian or fully probabilistic version of those, of those models. Okay, um, and now what's nice about casting this in a graphical model setting is that graphical models, one, are modular, which means we can embed them in more complicated models, and that's what we're gonna do next. Um, but two, there's something general about these graphical models in the sense that, I'll go back to it again, in the sense that this data generating distribution can be changed. Okay, so for example, people have used exactly this model instead of modeling words as grouped in documents, modeling pixels grouped in images, where instead of generating words from topics, this is a distribution over, say, color histogram values, and they're generating pixels from different color histogram topics. Okay? This, this data generating distribution can be changed to whatever you like, and the underlying inference algorithms for dealing with this complicated mixed membership structure remain the same. That's what I mean by general. Yeah. So this could extend to any conjugate exponential kind of setting. Yeah, that's right. Have you played around with it? Um, a little bit with images. Actually, the data generating distribution doesn't necessarily have to be conjugate to anything. Um, it's, and, but the, the Dirichlet structure to its left, uh, that stays the same in what I'm discussing now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Okay, although we didn't talk about it much, variational inference is very fast and it allows us to analyze these kinds of large data sets. Um, and finally, if you want to play with this model, you can download some code at my website um, in C that you could use to analyze this data. That's how I analyze this data. Sam. So uh, just a sort of general question, both the variational methods and the MCMC methods, because they never really mix, have the property that they sort of find one mode, one plausible posterior mode yeah. and approximate it. And their strength comes from the fact that not only do you get a sort of point estimate, but you get some indication of the volume of the mode that allows you to do sensible calculation of uncertainty. Yeah. But from a statistician's point of view, these things that you're estimating are really nuisance parameters. And you know, if I run it once and I get some set of topics and I run it again and I get a different set of topics, that's okay because in principle there should be sort of integrated out. So the question is, what's the sort of quantitative measure of uh, success here, or what's the, the goal? Like, I should preface it by saying that I think these are great, and I have done a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. Exactly as you say, it, it's incredibly useful for interacting with the data. But from a statistical point of view, it seems like any particular model that you fit has no real status because really those are just nuisance parameters. So, what, how would you measure how well these things are doing? How would you state what the goal is? Because I think if you go to professor Says a defense, Mehran. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think you're right. Go, keep going, Sam. Yeah, um, that's a good large question that keeps me up at night. Now, so in, in, in this paper, what we did was say, well, how can we measure how good these models are? We can measure them by how well they fit data. And so we hear what we said was, if we look at held out data, in other words, take a collection, take a part of the collection and pretend like you haven't observed it and ask what probability does your model assign to that unobserved part, that's a measure of how good the model is. But that doesn't really satisfy you, it shouldn't, because what kind of task is that? I, you don't wake up in the morning and decide I want to assign high probability to things that I see. And so, um, you know, what I, what I have come to kind of think is that these unsupervised models, what they provide are useful descriptive statistics of data that you can't get otherwise. And so what you'll see in the next section of the talk a, a, a little bit is how you might use these kinds of models to build browsers of exploring data that's otherwise unstructured. I mean, 
while it's not a rigorous statistical question, the fact is that JSTOR has scanned all these documents. They have them all in no order at all, and there's no topic labels to them. And you have to do something to organize that if you want to build a browser for someone to say, oh, I'm reading this article about astronomy. Hey, here are some other articles about astronomy that might be interesting. Um, so in that spirit, have you thought about the task, for example, given a document, to find the most similar document in your repository? Yep, we're going to see two that. Two different models and kind of ask people to say, OK, which, which really is more similar to the Right. Evaluated that way. We haven't evaluated that, but 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 yeah, that's I'm going to show that that kind of measure of similarity in the next part of the talk. We should probably let you get to that other part of the talk because I expect these questions are going to apply just as well to that. Oh yeah, yeah. The, I mean, these are these are good questions. So, right. But the third, I did want to say one more thing, which is something that I'm looking into now is developing these models where there's some response variable associated with each topic, and you want to predict that, and suddenly. It's so nice because I can sleep again because I know that I can measure how good two models are at predicting a response in a way that's satisfying. But I don't think that we should belittle the sort of vagueness of useful descriptive statistics of unorganized data because we all want to organize data. Isn't that, yeah. <laughs> and man, why are you asking that question here? Because <laughs> you're on sabbatical. All right. So next thing I want to talk about are dynamic topic models. So this goes a little bit to your question, where, where, y you know, you can you can draw this pretty picture, and um, you can say, well, what, what are the assumptions here? You know, this is a, seems like a reasonable thing, but there are assumptions here. And, and, and are those assumptions appropriate? So one assumption that this picture is making is that the documents are exchangeable. What, what does exchangeable mean in terms of probability distributions? It means if I reorder my documents and ask what's the probability of those documents shuffled under my model, it's going to have exactly the same probability, no matter what ordering I give it. Okay. And so in other words, the order of the data doesn't matter. But in the case of what we're trying to do here with science, this is really quite restrictive. So here's an example. Um, here are two articles from our complete corpus. This one's from 1890 called Instantaneous Photography. And it's a nice article. And this is from 1977 called Infrared Reflectance in Leaf-Sitting Neotropical Frogs. Okay. <laughs> Now, these two articles are really both about photography, right? In 1890, there was some science of photography, and somebody wrote this article. In fact, it was probably the beginning of photography. Um, and uh, luckily, their cousin was around to take pictures of, throwing the discus. And, and in 1977, somebody's photography was about taking pictures of these frogs in tropical places, and, and a whole different kind of technology was needed to do that. But if you're interested in photography, you might be interested in both these articles. Now, the problem is that these are about the same topic, but they're really not exchangeable. You can't imagine that this article could have come before this article. And so what we wanted to do was develop a, a topic model where the topics evolved over time. I should say that this work was funded by you guys. So thanks. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is, yeah, Mark. The, the vocabulary of a particular topic is going to change over time? Exactly, okay. exactly. So if I want to talk about photography and I'm a guy in 1890, I'm going to use a whole different set of words than you in the year 1977 are talking about photography. Okay, so the idea is pretty simple. We're going to divide the corpus into sequential slices by year. So we're going to say, okay, you know, all the articles in 1890, slice. 1891, slice. 1892, slice, and so on. And we're going to assume that each slice's documents are exchangeable. So I don't care if something was written in September of 1890 versus January of 1890, but I do care if it was written in 1890 versus 1960. Um, and then we're going to allow these topic distributions over words to evolve from slice to slice. OK, so as a graphical model, you're now experts. This is what it looks like. 
Okay, so let me kind of unpack this for you a little bit. If you turn your head this way, you recognize each slice is the same LDA model that we just described, where each document comes from a distribution over topics, choose a topic, choose a word, and so on. Okay, and here are the K topics for that slice. So this is 1890. Now, in 1891, what happens is the topics march forward one year, and they change a little bit. And now here is the LDA model in 1891, and in 1892, and all the way up to 2002. This model assumes that the population of topics is identical. You can't have you can't have a new topic springing into existence halfway through. It it models that by simply not using it until a certain time. But yes, it does so, make that assumption. So that topic has zero uh, zero probability up until you know, the first atomic bomb, and then uh, yeah. Then but but that's actually a limitation of this of this model. But but uh, no, but, but it can't be what. David, what Pablo just said, because the alphas aren't, their alphas are constant over time. But in the posterior, it just simply won't use a topic if it's got enough, enough uh, momentum later on that it can. But as a generative model, it doesn't know about the idea of topics appearing in distance. Correct, it correct. It just knows how to hijack a topic. And yes, <laughs> yes, right. yes, exactly. So, right, and that's a, and that is a limitation with this model. It, you think that there are 100 topics that somehow, gene uh, Right, lasers existed in 1890, but they just didn't. Nobody just started talking about them until 1950. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not as bad a failure as one topic actually mutating into another topic over time, and it seems like that's also possible here. Right, that can theoretically happen here, although we didn't see it. Um, there are some kind of funny hyperparameters. Let me get to the model, and and I can tell you where that Is any could happen. Is structure between topic like uh, chemistry, physics? Nope, nope. We're, this is the simplest possible dynamic topic model we could think of where there's just K topics. Remember, we don't know anything about chemistry or physics because we don't know yet what the collection is. But um, there's just K topics, and each one evolves separately over time. That's the assumption. OK. Now the question is, and this relates again to this criticism of the Dirichlet, is that how are we going to model topics evolving over time? The Dirichlet isn't really necessarily too amenable to that. And so what we did was we took something called the logistic normal distribution, which is a, a distribution that basically you take a multivariate Gaussian, draw a, a vector from it, exponentiate that vector, and then map it onto the simplex so that it sums to 1. And that get, gives you a mapping from a Gaussian random variable to the simplex, to the, dis, to the set of vectors that sum, positive vectors that sum to 1. And so what we did was we combined that with a state space model, a, basically a dynamic, a dynamic model. Um, uh, to build the notion of a distribution over words that changes over time. So the idea is, this is bad notation, but beta before was a distribution over words. Now beta is just this real valued vector. So beta t, k, so this is the teeth topic, sorry, the kth topic at time t. So in 1960, this is one of the topics, a distribution over my words. Given that same topic in 1959, is going to be distributed as a normal whose mean is that topic in 1959, although when I say topic, I mean real valued, um, and then some little covariance, which, which represents how much it can move from year to year. Okay, And then what we do, the probability of a word given this beta value is, just don't worry about this if you don't understand it, it's basically the way of mapping this to a probability distribution over words. OK? So it's just a little Gaussian random walk in topic space for each word. So if I have 20,000 words in a topic, then I have 20,000 little chains marching forward in time. And words like, I don't know, old-fashioned words for camera lose steam, and words that are, as, as new words for camera appear, it gain steam. And we have this process for each topic. OK, we draw it as a graphical model like this, where you see that each Top, each, the topic at each time, oh, look at that, I reversed the indices, uh, depends on the one previous. It's clear? Yeah. So where does sigma come from? Uh, we could estimate sigma, but we just set it to something small. And this answers your question, well, not really, but this is the hyperparameter I'm talking about. If sigma is too large, then the model will be able to explain new topics by just saying, oh, yeah, I know it was these words, but then they all change because it's so variant, varied. And now it's these words. And so there, 
if sigma was too large, then the model would be able to do that. But if you just set sigma to be pretty small or put a prior on sigma that makes it want to be small, then you don't have that problem. But if you make it too small, then you'll actually be able to model the variation over time. So it seems like it might be tricky to set. Uh, it's sensitive. Um, if you make it too small, let me show you what happens. And I, I'll, I'll answer that question later on, Mark. <laughs> punk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> our goal, as usual, is to compute the posterior distribution. All we observe hiding that are these words, and we want to compute all of the hidden structure. But now that hidden structure is even more than before. It's everything. Over all the years, it's all the topics, and for each year, it's all of this hidden structure in for each document. Okay. And again, exact inference is impossible. If you don't believe me, just think that at each time slice we have an LDA model for which exact inference is impossible. Um, and moreover, actually in this case, whereas things like Gibbs sampling are practical for LDA, Gibbs sampling is not practical, one, because of how much data we have, and two, because we've lost this conjugacy property that made the math easy. Um, and Gibbs sampling really relies on that to be efficient. So you'd have to do some kind of Metropolis-Hastings thing, and that involves tuning a whole bunch of other stuff. So here we, use, we did variational inference again to fit for all of these articles this entire time series of topics. And I can go into that in more detail. Oh, I'll go into a little detail now, but really more details at the end if you want it. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about what variational inference is quickly so, so you know and might want to learn about it. Okay, so forgetting everything, we're, what we're after is a distribution of these hidden variables given our observations. And what things like Gibbs sampling and MCMC that we've mentioned a few times today do are define Markov chains on those hidden variables such that the limiting distribution of those chains is the distribution we care about. And then you approximate the distribution you care about by looking at empirical distribution of samples from that chain. The problem is you don't really know when it got to its limiting distribution, so you just guess or use some heuristics. Variational methods is an alternative approach to approximating that distribution. And the idea is you define another family of distributions, Q, on the same space of the distribution you care about. Here it's the latent thematic structure. Then you find the member of that family of distributions that's closest in KL divergence to the true posterior. So here P is the true posterior that we care about, and Q is this family of distributions that we can search over to find the member that's closest to P. And the idea is that if you define a simple family of distributions, which doesn't contain your actual posterior, then this optimization problem can be, you can find a local optimum of this optimization problem. So you're kind of trading off not knowing when the chain has converged to the true thing that you care about to not knowing what assumptions you're making by simplifying your family of distributions, Q, but at least knowing when you get to a local optimum. Okay, and if you're interested, we can go into mathematical details at the end of this talk, if anyone's interested. Okay, so now, instead of analyzing 10 years of science, we're going to analyze the entire collection of JSTOR science, 1880 to 2002. And just to re remind you, there's no reliable punctuation metadata references or anything like that. We really have to take this kind of statistical approach where these are just a bunch of words, it's just a bunch of ASCII text, and I'm going to try to find structure in it. Here we have a vocabulary of 30,000 terms. Um, this is actually a little incorrect. We, we do have 30,000 terms, but we compute them in a little complicated way. I can tell you about it later. Um, in short, the data are 76 million words and 130,000 articles. Okay. So here, again, is one of these articles. This is called Sequencing the Genome Fast from 2000. Um, and again, I can do, so I can look at the 2000 LDA model and ask for the topics that this article is about. Um, and here again is that histogram where a handful of the, of the topics seem to be activated. And again, we can look at the top words from those articles and see that, okay, here are words about genetics, it's captured that again. Here are words about devices and technology, it's captured that. And here are words about data analysis. Yeah? Quick question. Um, how long did it take to build that model and how long does it take to do inference on one article? Inference on an article is very fast. Um, I can give you a kind of order of, order of 30 seconds, maybe 15. Um, 
fitting this model, I think it was like 24 hours. But this is all, I usually don't have to talk about this, or people usually aren't interested, but this is all very parallelizable. So it's, this has this kind of EM flavor where you can spread out your E step across many, many nodes and then um, combine them to create your model and then spread out your E step again across many nodes and combine them. And so um, if you can do that, then, then you can fit these very quickly. I've heard you guys can do that. <laughs> so, and so uh, another thing we can do with this model is now we can take this topic, right? Here, is the, here are these words, device, devices, materials, current. But this is, of course, the year 2000. And we can ask, OK, what did that distribution over words look like over time? And here what I've done is I've looked at the top 10 words from that topic, topic 35 or whatever it might be. And um, I've, I've listed them at each decade. So there really are distributions over words through each decade, but I've just taken each decade and said, OK, here in 2000, we have device, devices, materials, current, gate. And as you go back in time, you can see that the model seems to have captured something, something salient about these documents through time. So it starts out by talking about electric, machine, power, engine, steam, iron, battery. And through time, it ends up talking about device, devices, materials, current, gate. I don't. I want to caution against overinterpreting these kinds of things. You don't want a historian to look at this and say, this is definitive evidence that blah, 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 blah. But nonetheless, we can kind of casually agree that um, these things are related to each other. That the way one talks about machines, engines, steam, and iron, and batteries in 1880, one talks about devices, current, silicon, technology, and materials in 2000. But remember, we're casually agreeing to that. <laughs> <clears throat> What's that? What happens to two since uh, the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tubes went out of style, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, they're still there in 1970. What's that? Oh, they're still there in 1970. That's because of tubes amps, tube amps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So the other thing we can do is take a single word from, from one of these topics and ask, OK, let's look at its probability over time. And this is, gonna, this is the second part of your uh, forward thinking questions. So um, here I've taken two topics. I, I really shouldn't name them because I want to stress that these topics have nothing. Uh, they're not named in advance. We don't know anything about physics or neuroscience in advance. But I took two topics, one which kind of looks like physics and one which kind of looks like neuroscience. And I've plotted. Um, words through time of those topics. So here in the physics topic, you see words like force kind of lose steam over time. Words like relativity peak, and words like laser peak later on in life. Um, and here in the neuroscience, you see words like neuron going down, sorry, nerve going down, neuron going up, and then an oxygen kind of peaking here. Oxygen is interesting for two reasons, um, one of which is funny. And the funny reason is that I kind of was confused by this, and I looked up why oxygen was peaking. And basically, there were all these crazy experiments in the 50s and 60s, I think, where they would deprive people of oxygen and then ask them questions, like have them solve problems and see how they did. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the not funny reason, but still interesting, is that this captures a, a a point I want to make about these models, which is that they can somehow capture polysemy. So it's not as though the word oxygen is less popular later on. People are still using the word oxygen in droves. But the thing was, it wasn't used within the context of neuroscience anymore. And so oxygen actually has low probability here, even though it has a high probability in other topics. And it has high probability here. Um, and right, so the same word can have high probability or low probability in different topics. It, and and uh, yeah, I'm losing articulateness, so keep it at that. <laughs> um, Mark's point. Relativity wasn't invented until somewhere around here. Yet you see that it's slowly ramping up to that. Now, it's not as though Einstein is thinking about it and like he's <laughs> like got these ideas. It's, this is the sigma parameter again. It only lets you move a little bit. And so to explain the frequency of relativity here, it needs to, it needs to say, OK, well, it actually moved a little bit up. It's yeah, yeah, it's oversmoothing. That's one word for it. So um, 
Right, and something we'd like to do actually is embellish this model, make it more realistic, to have a model of not just topics occurring, but of words occurring at some point. Because really that's, that seems to, to model more what, what's happening in the data. Okay. <clears throat> so, I want to now go back to this point that this is all fun, but what's it good for? And what I said it might be good for is useful descriptive statistics of data that otherwise doesn't have any structure. And uh, here I want to show that in this similarity metric that you mentioned. So one thing we can do with, this, with this, these hidden variables, so remember theta are the topic proportions, those histograms, we can ask, let's take the theta for one article and let's take the theta for another article and ask how similar are those thetas to each other, okay? And a, and these are each distributions over our 100 topics. And so we can use the Hellinger distance, which is a symmetric distance between distributions, as a measure of how similar two articles are. So I'm an article and you're an article, and we each have our own topics, and our similarity is defined by the similarity between our topic proportions. Okay, so you can see, of course, theta is a hidden variable, so we take its expectation given the different documents. So WI is a document, WJ is a document. Given those, what's the expected distance between their topic proportions and a model? Okay, so basically what we're doing is we're using the latent structure to define similarity. Now, I think this is particularly interesting in the dynamic topic model because time has now been factored out. Because remember, I might be an article from 1950 and you might be an article from 1910. Now, to get your theta, you used a totally different set of topics than I did, but yet we're comparing these two thetas because we believe that these thetas have something to do with each other. So this is kind of like a time-corrected document similarity metric. So here's an example. This is an article called The Brain of the Orang. It's from 1880. And basically, this article is about the scientist who found an orangutan bopped him on the head, cut him open, drew what he saw, sent it to Thomas Edison, who was the founder of science, and got it published. Okay? Now we take this article and we look at what are the posterior probability proportions here. And here we have our distribution over the 100 topics, and you can see a handful of them are activated. Now, in the entire 130,000 article collection, we can ask what's the most similar article to this article? Okay, this is all the articles spanning the 120 years. And the most similar article to this article is representation of the visual field on the medial wall of the occipital parietal cortex in the owl monkey from 1976, which arguably is about exactly the same thing, only this scientist had to use a totally different language for describing what he saw when he bopped the monkey on the head. And, <laughs> and a classical similarity metric won't find any similarity between these two articles because it's based only on word use. And word use drastically changed between 1880 and 1976. But nonetheless, we might, as scholars and scientists using JSTOR, actually be interested in these two articles being determined to be about the same kinds of thing. So <clears throat> all this can be put together in a browser. Yeah. Does that mean that one of your 100 topics is dedicated to bopping monkeys on the head? Uh, <laughs> no, these are both. I think that this big one is like neuroscience, and this little one is monkeys. <laughs> Everyone, <knows. laughs> But I'm not sure. When I don't know, I just joke around. So, um, but, but no, yeah, it's basically the neuroscience thing. But, but the, um, it, it's funny. When we, when we look at these pictures we, and, and, say, look at the words with high probability, we take a lot of stake in what's the biggest one. But actually, this similarity uses quite a bit these other ones. That's what differentiates these two articles from each other rather than any other neuroscience articles because it really takes into account the, the structure everywhere else. Okay. Oh, yeah. So what you can do then is take all this hidden structure, again, useful descriptive statistics, and build a browser of this otherwise totally unstructured collection of documents. So here's another example. So we did this where <clears throat> here at the top you see an article, Automatic Analysis, Theme Generation, and Summarization of Machine Readable Texts. Okay? This is an article from 1994 by Salton and Allen and Buckley. And I actually, who's the last author on this? Someone from Google. Yeah, yeah, it is. I shouldn't have covered him up, but <laughs> nonetheless. So, um, 
Yeah. So this is like kind of a classical article about doing the things that we like to do. And what we can do is we can say, OK, here's this article. And when you click on this, you get to the original article. Here are the, the three topics that it's about. So these are the topics with highest probability in those topic proportions. You can see one is about computers and data, one's about library science, and then one is just this weird topic, two, three, four different single that kind of captures other words, um, quantitative words, it looks like. And so, so that's one thing you can look at. And then here we have a list of other articles in the collection in order of their similarity by that time-corrected similarity metric that I just described. And you can see that the top article is Global Text Matching for Information Retrieval. That's another article by two of the same authors, Salton and Buckley, so that makes sense. And that's something that a classical or traditional similarity metric would find. But not too far down the list, in 1962, Simple and Rapid Method for the Coding of Punched Cards. And here's a figure from that, and that's an article basically about, in the 60s, taking punch cards and um, encoding authors and subjects um, and titles, or I guess not titles, just authors and subjects on these punch cards. Arguably, the same type of technology that's being developed here, again, a totally different language, totally different use of words, but if you're looking for the, the article similar to this, you're going to want to read this article. And then, again, it's still in the top 10, we have from 1899, The Storing of Pamphlets a fascinating article about the problem of having pamphlets all over your office and needing to store them places. <laughs> and again, arguably, this is about scientists trying to deal with all their information, and this is about scientists trying to deal with all their information, too. And this is a good article. It's basically about how you should get a box and put them in the box. <laughs> all right. Just an aside on this, yeah. and getting back to Yuri's question about how do you evaluate this stuff. I remember yeah. coming back from a conference and showing this paper, and I think it was the Jordan and Bly from 2003, was it, uh -huh. uh, to Amit Singhal. And I said, you know, this is really interesting. Take a look at this. And he looked at it, and he looked at the evaluation section, and he said, ah, perplexity. Yeah. That's what we always measured, but we couldn't get recall and precision. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we didn't even try. <laughs> but, but yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that perplexity is basically held out likelihood, although that's um, what I'm going to show now. Um, <laughs> but there's no labels here, so you can't do precision and recall. Well, yeah, you can invent some tasks. Right? You can, you can, you can, you can, you can pay a few students to kind of, you know, label something and kind of use that as your test. Something I'm, I'm talking with some psychologists about, it, these user studies that you're talking about, where you could do something like, say, um, take a bunch of articles and divide them in half and ask someone to match the two halves and then see if you can do as well as people at matching the two halves. That might be a better measure of, of how useful it is. I mean, you and he are right that perplexity is not satisfying because you just might not care. If, if down the line something that gives us better, wor worse perplexity provides just as good a, a browsing experience or whatever it is we care about, then who cares about perplexity? Um, but I don't think that you would get that. I think if we did a user study with the similarity stuff, I don't think you would get the same kind of, the same kind of uh, output. But you can do a direct comparison, right? And the, the, the easiest thing to do is you have two algorithms. Each one would give you kind of most similar documents, say top three or ten, yeah, whatever yeah. you choose. And then kind of you know hide which, which is coming from which and, and, and have a bunch of users say, and they should tell you this is better than this or this is worse than this. But do we really want to be in the business of inventing a problem to evaluate the solution we've already developed? I mean, I think Dave has an interesting problem and a solution. Well, one thing I don't have is users. So <laughs> for me, that kind of infrastructure is a bit more difficult to implement. But I do think it would be very, very interesting. So, so in. So one thing, I mentioned this polysemy thing. Um, Tom Griffiths, who's a cognitive scientist, did some work on correlating this with thesauri and people's notion of, of words that go together and, and found correlation. So that's another alternative measure of how good the model is. Um, ultimately, the model is good if I think JSTOR wants to use this kind of thing. How do they decide whether to use yours or somebody else's? Yeah, I guess that's really, yeah. Yeah, but at some point you want people to say, aha, we beat Bly et al. With That's true. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and here's, here's their model, here's our model, and look, we beat them on this yeah. metric. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
besides just, you know, beating people, which has a whole moral issue to it, is what <laughs> Sam was kind of talking about, which is the, if you think of the model as nuisance parameters or something that is really has deep structure, right? And so there's this issue of stability, that if you were to run the model multiple times on different samples of the data, yes. to what extent are you generating the same topics? Yes. Right? And have you guys looked at anything like that? No. I just had a conversation with someone about this like two weeks ago, and I, I think that's a great idea to understand the correlation between the topics found by different subsets of the data as a measure of how good it is because somehow if you are doing these kinds of descriptive statistics then what you want is exactly what you said, you want stability. You want to know that if I didn't happen to see these articles I would have gotten the same results. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly right. All your data are about science, right? These data are all from the journal Science. So they say I have an article about baseball, not, not science at all. Can yeah. you ever identify the outlier? Is it an outlier? Is it a non science article? Um, the models I'm presenting now can't really do that, but there, there are this other class of models called non-parametric Bayesian models that, are, that, that have that idea built into them, that here's an article, it's about something new. And those are, the, I've worked on those as well. Those are, those are worth considering. Yeah. So maybe you're selling yourself a little short because you could evaluate the marginal log likelihood or approximate it for such a document to exist at such a time in the collection. Absolutely, you can find so that. So you could do outlier detection. Yeah, yeah, you could kind of look at the likelihood and say, oh, that likelihood's way down there. Everything else is bunched over here. Absolutely. Well, well, exactly. Just the proportion of words that are in the vocabulary would tell you it's not fine, right? Yeah. There's always an easy hack, but no one gives <laughs> no, talks and about it. If you have to look at words that are in the vocabulary, then who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. Document these words with any kind of side information, like the author's name as an author's name or? None. So, um, so what JSTOR does is they really just take the journals, scan them, and then plop the raw ASCII down in a file. So there's no, nobody has marked up, nobody has marked up authors. Titles or abstracts or authors. Or citations. I mean, all these things are very, yeah, yeah, no, nothing. All these things are very useful. They now have bibliography information. The way they did it was by farming it out to, to people to do by hand. So they have some bibliography information. Um. So a lot of the salient information is in fact hidden in the source. Better exactly. You, you want to cap, these are all hidden as patterns in this just raw ASCII data. Do you use the position within the document or just the? No, that's something we haven't mentioned. That the, All the words are, are assumed to be of equal weight. The fact that the two authors first name last name are next to each other is not even right. accessible. I mean, again, tricky Python coding could get more information out of this, perhaps. But the, the, the point is that you can actually get a lot out of just yeah. collections of words grouped into documents. Yeah. OK. I'm trying to imagine what the next layer of complexity on top of this that would uh, give it more detail. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think looking at stability is, is important. And I also think that. Um, well, at the end, I'll, I'll allude to some things that I think are needed in this model. So uh, we're running out of time. Well, we've, we've invalidated this graph, so <laughs> <laughs> I can skip it. But since I worked hard on it, I'll just say quickly that what this is is, so we, we can ask, how, how much better is this dynamic topic model than the fully exchangeable topic model? You know, is it really fitting the data better? And this is negative log likelihood of a, of a held out set. Actually, so not exactly a held out set. What, what we've done is we said, OK, imagine I've seen the articles from 1880 to 1910, OK? Now I can do one of two things. I can fit an LDA model to those articles and then ask, what's the probability of the articles in 1911? Or I can fit a dynamic topic model to those articles and ask, what's the held out probability of the articles in 1911? So a better pr model of prediction will assign higher probability to the, to the articles of 1911. And so lower numbers here are better. And what you can see is that the, the dynamic topic model always provides a better fit. And I'm going to ask you to do something that is impossible, which is ignore the shape of this curve. So I made a, a mistake, and I didn't normalize for the number of words. There's different numbers of words in each of these years. And so that affects, of course, additively the, the negative log likelihood. And so this shape is meaningless. What's meaningful is that the dynamic topic model is always lower than the fully exchangeable model. You'll have so many more parameters. 
Why but this is held out likelihood, so more parameters should mean overfitting in a sense. Although they're not exactly parameters because we've we've regularized via this dynamic process, yeah. right? Because essentially, in in both models, we have a prior over over the topics, and so one is a Dirichlet prior. Here, it's a dynamic prior. That's essentially what we're comparing. Other than that, the generating process is the same. Oh, that's a good. We didn't we didn't look at that. So that's a, that would be a great thing to look at to take the model fit from 1880 to 1910 and then fit from 1911 to 2002 and see how. Yeah, it's a great idea. Also, do you expect that the fact that the <clears throat> so suppose I, I, I gave the LDA just 1905 to 1910, right? yeah. just to help it a little bit, maybe. Uh, does the fact that uh, the dynamic model has more historic information, will that help it in any way? Yeah, so I tried that. I, I went just one year back, and the LDA perplexity just, sh the, the LDA negative log likelihood just uh, sh shot through the roof. It was terrible. Yeah. So in other words, LDA might be being hurt by giving it more information, is what you're saying, from yeah. further back. Yeah, no, I, we, we investigated that. It, it's off this chart. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. Um, let's just go to the end. So complicated stuff leads to a, another model where, again, so one of these, uh, one of the problems with the model, like you mentioned, this Dirichlet over the topic proportion. So if a document's about um, genetics and evolutionary biology, then, and we're putting a Dirichlet prior on that, that's actually saying seeing genetics and seeing evolutionary biology are totally independent. But we all know that that's not true. That um, these topics, if they are topics that we're discovering, are going to have some kind of correlation structure. And the Dirichlet actually prevents us from modeling that because there's a hidden assumption in the Dirichlet, which is that these components, these 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 slots in that cartoon histogram, are are uh, almost independent. They're slightly negatively correlated because it all has to sum to one. So one thing can't be really big without something else getting really small. But there, you can't. It, you can't model a correlation structure that, that geology happens with astronomy, for example. And so we relax that again with this logistic normal where we draw a multivariate Gaussian there instead. Um, and from that, to make a long story short, you can find a map of these topics. So here we have our topics as before, and now the size is proportional to how often they occurred in the corpus. And this is from 20 years of science. So this is an exchangeable model, but one where these topics are mapped. And you can see things like, um, you know, we have neuroscience somewhere up here, and we have biology over here, and we have geology over here, and so we can capture this mapping. And again, this might be a useful description for someone who wants to browse. If they are interested in this, species and force, and then they say, oh, I really should read all these articles about dinosaurs, too. Okay. So, I know we're out of time. Um, the whole point of this, one, these probabilistic topic models provide useful descriptive statistics for analyzing and understanding the latent structure of large text collections by building browsers, by organizing what's otherwise unstructured. And this isn't limited to just scientific articles. There's lots of unstructured data. For example, uh, I think about query data with the dynamic topic model that over, say, 20 years, you might want to analyze trends and patterns in query data, and these kinds of models can help you do that. Um, more generally, probabilistic graphical models are a useful way to express our assumptions about the hidden structure of otherwise complicated data and to figure out what that hidden structure might be under that model, but of course paying attention to the fact that we are actually making a lot of assumptions about it. Um, all of this posterior inference on such large data sets is thanks to variational methods. Um, and to answer your question, so what are the kinds of next things that we want to do with this? Well, there's all kinds of problems with that dynamic topic model. So one is choosing the number of topics. So in LDA, there's this nice non-parametric Bayesian formalism that lets us model the notion of, oh, here's a new topic and it just appeared, um, and we can do that within this probabilistic setting. Now, it doesn't quite work in the dynamic topic model because of this assumption that the topics exist for all time and are changing, even if we're not using them. And so what we're thinking about is, is adapting what are called birth-death processes, where you imagine a topic appearing and disappearing, but then building that into the model and building all the inference machinery is, is, is not easy. Um, 
something else we're working on are continuous time dynamic topic models. So somehow, if I write an article on December 31st, 1967, um, why should that be in the 1967 model rather than the 1968 model? And so we're working on models where each document has a timestamp, which they do. Um, and we want to build one of these topic models that, that smoothly changes the topics over time rather than having these rather arbitrary discrete points. Topic models for prediction, this is what I mentioned, helps me sleep because now we have documents and we have something we want to predict and we have a way of actually evaluating it without a, a long discussion, um, which I enjoyed. And um, <laughs> finally, something, another interesting, uh, I think this is really interesting. So, I mean, I, I, don't, that's, I think this is interesting. I'm going to, I want to do this, which is inferring the impact of a document. So there, the idea is this. See, in the exchangeable model, you don't have this luxury. But, la, 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 la. OK. It's not going to be good to be here. But anyways, OK. So, right. In the exchangeable topic model, you don't have this luxury. But here, we have this notion that we have an ordering among the documents. And we could say that, look, when Einstein wrote this article in 1917, that turned out to be a very influential article. And we can model that with a hidden variable, a hidden variable that says this is the influence of this article on the future. And basically, this is a bibliography-free method of assessing how much the word use of this article affected the word use in the future. And so we're working on a model where each document is endowed with its own impact, basically. And then you can determine, in a posterior sense, how influential was this article or news article or query or whatever on what happened subsequently. And this lets you take things like bibliometrics, which really were restricted to analyzing citations, and analyze lots of other kinds of sequential collections, like emails or queries, using the same idea of impact. So that's something, another, well, he's gone, or he's there, I don't know, but yeah. Do you have any plans of like, um, taking a citation analysis and put it together with this model, and have a more model which takes multiple data sources? And well, there's been good work on that, partly by <laughs> Dave. And, um, and, and yeah, so I, I'm not working on that personally, but, but yeah, so one thing nice about these models, and you can talk to Dave about this, is that there you can add structure and, and because it's in this graphical models formalism, you can kind of add other variables for things like citations or authors. People have worked on what are called author topic models, where they've added th those kinds of information and used the authorship to, again, influence the, the topic proportions and things like that. So yeah. Most of that um, has been done in the sampling uh, paradigm. Yeah. And um, so my question would be, Having this variation or collapse variation inference, does it make it you know easier or more efficient? I think that the author topic model could be fit with variational methods just as easily. Yeah, there's a real deep connection between, in the fully conjugate case, the coordinate ascent variational algorithm and the Gibbs updates. Um, I can show you them afterwards if you want. I have a slide about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The full correlation matrix among topics, or do you use yeah. Some oh, parameters? I didn't mention that, so that's kind of exciting. So yeah, we we do, and to get a sparse one, what we use is um, this lasso trick by Buhlmann and Meinchausen, um, uh, which is to find sparse correlation matrices via a lasso penalty, and so that's how we that's how we got this kind of nice sparse graph from our basically 100 by 100 correlation matrix. That's how we find the zeros in the inverse correlation matrix. Yeah. So it's a sparse inverse correlation. Matrix. Yes, sparse inverse correlation, because that, that denotes the dependency structure. Yeah. Other question? Oh, thanks. <laughs>